The Slaughtered Wolf The Slaughtered Wolf is the name of a cozy pub north of Boltby in the North York Moors. It's my home away from home. On any night on a full moon, country folk gather together at the Slaughtered Wolf at dusk and drink until dawn. Some call it a tradition, but it's much more than that. The Slaughtered Wolf is a classic old-style one-room pub with a fireplace, candles on the walls, a dartboard, tables set up with chessboards, and drinks that never stop flowing. The exterior of the pub is bordered with a beautiful flowering plant known as Wolfsbane. The comfy pub might well be mistaken for a cottage if it weren't for the foreboding sign outside featuring the severed head of a wolf. It was a full moon on a Saturday night when a monster of a storm had descended upon the desolate countryside. The rain was freezing cold like blades of ice. Even the raging fireplace couldn't defeat the chill that had settled deep within my bones. The lively chatter inside the pub's walls couldn't shield us from the roar of the thunder that shook the ground every few seconds. But still we knew we were safe in the pub on this cold, dreary, dangerous night. It was when a stranger entered the pub that all went silent and still. He stood intimidated for a moment as all eyes were cast upon him before he nervously said, Hello. An American boy, tall, thin, late teens, wearing a padded winter jacket, hiking across the moors, no doubt, evidently doing it solo, not even wearing a cap to defend against the rain. Ignorant, stupid, but weren't we all at that age? He gazed about the pub nervously and momentarily gawked at the pentagram inscribed within a circle that had been carved into the wall. That aspect of the pub gives most people pause, but that's fine with us. We don't care for strangers in these parts, especially during a full moon. They tend to entice that which we want to stay away. He meandered up to the bar, ordered a pint, and sipped at it as the regulars settled back in and continued their conversations. He wouldn't be a problem, not as long as he stayed inside the pub. I overheard the young man ask if there was an inn nearby that he could spend the night. There was, but it would take him near an hour to walk there. Much shorter, of course, if one of us were to give him a lift in a motor car, but none of us would be leaving the safety of the pub during a full moon. He finished three quarters of his pint, stepped up to the blazing fireplace, warmed his hands, and then headed for the door to leave. I stood up. Hold on, mate. You don't want to go back out there. The American boy turned toward me and grinned. I'm beat. I need a place to sleep. I'm headed for the inn. I pointed to a battered and worn couch near the corner of the pub. You can lie down there till morning. We'll make a point to keep things quiet for you. He took a glance at the uninviting couch and let out a chuckle. <laughs> no thanks, but if anyone wants to give me a lift to the inn, I'd be much obliged. Silence. The patrons of the pub looked around sheepishly. They wanted to help the lad, but none were going to risk their lives for him. After allowing us all plenty of time to speak up, the American boy shook his head with disappointment. Okay, then. As he left the security of the pub and closed the door behind him, I couldn't keep silent. I had to try something, so I yelled out to him, No! Don't go! There's something dangerous out there! The young lad didn't hear me, or didn't care. We were all hushed for a long moment before Maggie, the barkeep, spoke up. We can't let him go. I raised my voice. I tried to warn him. 
Our eyes widened with fear when we heard the howling. Deep, guttural and loud, like the blast of a demented, jagged tuba. It's close. Maggie tried to remain hopeful. Maybe he'll hear it and come back. I shook my head. It's too late. I grabbed my raincoat and rifle and hurried out the door. Several of the fellow pub dwellers joined me with their firearms and we trotted down the cobblestone path toward the direction of the inn. We could hear the attack taking place in the distance. Pure, relentless savagery and the tortured screams of the poor lad rang out louder than that of the beast itself. We fired our guns into the air and could hear the monster gallop away, but it wouldn't be gone for long. We had to hurry. We raced up the walkway and found the young man laying on his back. The feathers from his shredded jacket blanketed him like snow, and unfortunately for him, he was still alive. I could see the bite mark on his chest as he lifted himself up into a sitting position. He looked relieved that we were there. Again, the poor lad was showing his ignorance. Thank God you got here when you did. That thing was going to kill me. What was that? We looked at the young man somberly. He had been bitten. He had been cursed. There was only one thing we could do now. Sorry, lad. I pointed the barrel of my gun at his face. I'll never forget the fear that filled the young lad's eyes just before I pulled the trigger. Snowed in. I love snow days. I live alone in a high-rise apartment building in a small city. I'm on the fourth floor, so that makes the high-rise aspect of things moot. But I like living on a lower floor. I get to look down on the streets and see the action. The news had been warning us about one of the biggest snowstorms in modern history heading our way, and for once, the news was correct. The entire city was blanketed with walls of snow. I had never seen such big fat flakes in my entire life. My office had preemptively closed for the remainder of the week, so I had a mini vacation of sorts, although I was completely snowed in, so I couldn't go anywhere. And that was just fine with me. I had plenty of groceries to last the remainder of the week, and then some and lots of hot cocoa. Cuddling up on the couch under a fluffy blanket, sipping hot chocolate and watching movies for a few days sounded just fine to me. I watched the snowstorm begin the night before from my bedroom window and went to sleep shortly thereafter. I woke up to an honest-to-goodness winter wonderland. Mountains of snow covered the entrances of most of the buildings. There were only a few cars parked on the side of the roads and they were now completely buried and had become snow hills. I stood looking out the frosted window of my apartment and took in the glory of winter. It was magnificent. The snow continued to fall just as thick as it was the night before. The city looked deserted with the exception of two kids who were pulling a bright red sled down Main Street and a man in a thick orange snowmobile suit who was slogging through the snow mounds as he attempted to brush away the snow from his buried vehicle with a puny snowbrush. To his credit, he was making progress. I could see a fragment of the car's hood and a sliver of the driver's side window. Otherwise, I saw no signs of life at all. I went to my kitchen and poured myself a steaming cup of hot chocolate and topped it off with some mini marshmallows. The sweet fragrance of my chocolatey sensation lingered in the air, soothing my chilly bones. Cozy did not begin to describe this day. 
I fastened my plush Tinkerbell robe, picked up my cup of hot cocoa, and nestled into a cushy chair I had next to the window. I stared out at the falling snow and the peaceful serenity that had enveloped the city. I looked down at the street below me to see what kind of progress the children were making with their sledding adventure, but I didn't see them. All I saw was the red plastic sled sitting abandoned in the middle of the street. I turned my attention to the man in the snowmobile suit who had been working diligently to uncover his car from the Alp of Snow, but he was gone too. I spotted his snow brush sitting on top of the snow next to his vehicle, but no sign of the man. I peered over to the apartment building across the street to see if anyone else was gazing out their windows as well, when I noticed that the window directly across the street from mine was shattered. I studied the building closer and realized that the majority of the windows in the building were broken. What had happened? I inspected the office building next to it and noticed that several of the windows in that building were busted as well, and the windows that weren't broken were covered with snow, which was odd. Snow didn't typically cake windows like that, unless wind was forcing it to do so, but this wasn't just a few windows, it was all of them. I scanned the entire street and detected that every window of every building I could see was either broken or covered with snow. I was wondering why the snow hadn't plastered my windows as it had the other buildings, but no sooner did that thought enter my mind when the snowflakes began to pelt my window and stick to it like tiny fluffy gobs of gum. Usually, when snow sticks to a window, it melts, at least slightly due to the warmth on the other side, and the flakes run down the window. But this snow was different. It was moving up, down, sideways. It was crawling. The snowflakes were actually crawling all along my window. I didn't understand what was happening. I pressed my face against the glass to get a better look at the snowflakes, but they were too small to make out in detail. I grabbed a magnifying glass from a nearby drawer and pushed it against the window for a better look. What I saw made me gasp. These weren't snowflakes at all. They were tiny creatures camouflaged as snowflakes. Their minuscule round mouths were like tiny suction cups sucking away at the glass, not unlike a placostomous suckerfish might do on the side of an aquarium. I could make out rows of tiny fangs that were gnawing at the glass, and then I heard the screeching splintering as webs of fractures overtook the window. Within seconds, every window in my apartment shattered and the snowflake monsters were floating in and covering the floor of my apartment. From a distance, it would have appeared to be nothing more than enormous, beautiful flakes of snow dropping aimlessly through the broken windows. But there was nothing random about what was happening. The snowflake monsters weren't simply drifting into my apartment. They were swarming in droves. I didn't even have a chance to run and attempt to barricade myself inside my bedroom, not that that would have accomplished anything. The snowflake beasts were all over me like a swarm of bees on a glazed donut. I could feel their microscopic teeth nibbling at me. At first, I was just itchy, but when the blood appeared, I was burning with pain. The good news was that my suffering was short-lived because it only took them seconds to devour me.